Good afternoon and uh, welcome to today's Downing Street press conference. I'm very pleased to be joined by Sir Ian Diamond, the UK's National Statistician from the ONS, uh, and also by Dr Jenny Harry's Deputy Chief Medical Officer. The latest data from our COBRA coronavirus data file shows that as of today, there have now been 1,534,533 tests for coronavirus across the UK. That includes 86,583 tests carried out yesterday. 206,715 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 5,614 cases since yesterday. Of those who tested positive, very sadly, 30,615 people have now died, and my deepest condolences go out to anyone who's lost a loved one throughout this pandemic. Three weeks ago, before the Easter bank holiday weekend, I set out five tests for the UK to move on to the next phase in this pandemic. Then, just as now, there were calls to ease up on the restrictions. But as the science made clear, we couldn't responsibly do that. In fact, the advice from the group of scientific experts, SAGE, who advised the government, made it very clear that there weren't any changes at all that we could confidently take without risking a second peak in this virus. That's why we asked the public to keep going. We weren't done yet. We said stick to the plan, and the British public kept going. People stuck to the rules. That meant working from home, it meant worries about money, it meant adjusting to homeschooling, time apart from family and friends, and just not doing many of the things that we all enjoy in life. At the same time, there's been a lot of people who, despite their own personal sacrifices, have gone the extra mile. They volunteered to support the elderly and the vulnerable in their community, what, who have been shielded themselves away from the virus. And each Thursday, of course, we now come together to applaud the NHS staff and the carers, the people who just kept going to keep our country going. And because of that monumental effort, we've now passed the peak of the virus. The NHS hasn't been overwhelmed. We haven't seen hospital wards overwhelmed with patients, people left without hospital beds, people left without the ventilators that can mean the difference between life and death. Now, I know the tragic death toll in this country and around the world has been sobering for all of us. And there have been real challenges in this country uh, with PPE, with care homes. But in this first stage of the fight against COVID-19, through this national team effort, we've prevented the number of deaths rising to even higher levels, and we've ensured critically that the NHS had the capacity to cope. Today, Cabinet was updated on SAGE's advice on the progress that we've made to date. And as a result of the social distancing measures that we put in place, the R level, which signifies the rate of infection, is now between 0.5 and 0.9. The overall number of new cases has been steadily falling, and the rate of deaths is also steadily, steadily falling. Now, just to be clear about what all of this means in practice, the virus is not beaten yet. It remains deadly and infectious, and we're working very hard right across government and with local government to bring it down in areas of concern, like in care homes. And I'm confident we can do it, and we will do it. But because we held firm three weeks ago, we are now in a position to start to think about the next phase in this pandemic. So this weekend, the Prime Minister will set out the next steps which we can responsibly take over the following weeks, guided by the scientific advice and mindful, as we've said right from the, the word go, of taking the right decisions at the right time. Now, we can start setting out how we will live and work whilst maintaining the necessary social distancing rules. Uh, we can also be clear about those me measures which uh, are still necessary to prevent a second peak. The Prime Minister has been directing ministers and our teams of officials right across government to carefully develop a roadmap for the next phase. It contains appropriate measures to be taken at appropriate milestones subject to very clear conditions. And there will be detailed guidance to help inform, advise and reassure the public, businesses and other organisations. To get this right, we have set milestones. Some changes can confidently be introduced more quickly than others. And some of those other ones will take longer to introduce. And it's important to say this, at each point 
along the way, when we take these decisions, they'll be based on the five tests and the scientific advice that we receive. And as I set out in the fifth of our five tests, when I spoke here at this lectern on the 16th of April, the point at, we, the point at which we make even the smallest of changes to the current guidance will be a point of maximum risk. If people abandon the social distancing, if we forget the sacrifices that were made to get us through the peak, to get us to this point, the virus will grow again at an exponential rate. That would lead to a second peak, which would threaten the NHS. It would trigger another lockdown, which would prolong the economic pain. And we're determined to keep it temporary, to keep it as short as possible. So we've kept the current measures in place for this long precisely so that we can bounce back with vigour and energy as soon as possible, as soon as it is responsible to start uh, looking at the second phase. And because of that, our next steps will be sure-footed and sustainable. Any changes that we make will be carefully monitored. If people don't follow the rules or if we see that the R level goes back up, we will tighten the restrictions again. We will always retain the option to do so. That way we can safeguard public health and we can also safeguard the economy in a sustainable way. So having prepared carefully, based on the updated advice from SAGE, this weekend the Prime Minister will set out the roadmap for the next phase along with the conditions for reaching each milestone. Each milestone. That way we can provide the country with a better understanding of what lies ahead. We can offer reassurance that we will adjust the restrictions to the minimum necessary to prevent a second spike in the virus. And we can give people the confidence that we're doing it in a way that will protect life and preserve our way of life. And on that note, I'll hand over to Jenny to present the data on the latest slides. Thank you, Tim Secretary. Uh, first slide, please. Thank you. So this is just a very quick reminder of what we're all working to achieve and the five tests that the First Secretary has just mentioned uh, for adjusting the lockdown. And the slides that I'll go through now uh, show how we're uh, progressing towards that. Um, and the first thing here really is to reinforce uh, the action that people have taken. Sorry, could you revert the slide? Thank you. Uh, just to uh, show how much uh, people have been uh, following those social distancing rules um, and really helping to bring the rate of infection down, but also to be protecting each other. Uh, so the number of people uh, avoiding contact with vulnerable people um, of adults, 92% uh, have avoided contact with older or vulnerable people in the last seven days. So really looking out for each other. Um, and in general, 82% uh, have not left their home or only left their home for all the reasons that we know uh, that you should. Um, and that has reflected now in a uh, uh, much reduced uh, R rate and the opportunities that we have uh, going forward carefully to be adjusting the measures. Um, I think the other interesting thing looking forward is 44% uh, of adults uh, in employment have now said they've been working from home at some time in the last week, significantly changed from the 12% for the same time last year. Um, and that helps the social uh, distancing, but I think it also uh, perhaps helps people uh, recognise other opportunities for how they can work in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we see the uh, daily tests, uh, which have uh, increased. So the uh, tests yesterday, or rather up to nine o'clock this morning, uh, carried out were 86,500. Uh, there has been a little bit of a, a technical uh, hitch in the lab over the weekend, but that's now starting to rise again. Um, and uh, we will see in the following slides how that translates through uh, to our detection of disease. Next slide, please. Um, and here we have on this slide, so the blue pillar there is the NHS swab testing. Uh, the rates uh, of uh, case detection are coming down. These are primarily uh, within healthcare settings in hospitals. Uh, but the orange pillars on, on the top there represent uh, the increased capacity and numbers of tests that are being carried out. And obviously, uh, we hope overall that our case numbers will come down. But in this intervening period, while testing is increasing, then we expect those orange pillars to grow. So we will have increased case detection, uh, but we want to watch the, the blue pillars coming down as they are now. Next slide, please. 
Um, and this slide, uh, which we've seen before, but I think with some trepidation at the top of those peaks, we can now see uh, that just about all regions have uh, come right back down uh, to relatively low levels compared with the peak. Of course, I say relatively, uh, that uh, for the number of people uh, in hospitals, that still represents a huge workload for uh, NHS uh, frontline staff, but it does show uh, a decrease of 16% uh, over the last week. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and again, uh, reflected uh, from that last slide is the use of critical care beds. At one time, uh, there was obviously concern that with the rising epidemic, we would have sufficient capacity. Uh, there was a plan to manage that, and now uh, less than a third of critical care beds are occupied by COVID-19 patients, and that's been decreasing uh, right across the UK over the last two weeks. Um, and here we have the seven-day rolling average. Now, obviously, sitting behind this are recorded deaths, uh, none of which uh, we would wish to be there. But uh, in the, on the positive side of that is the fact that we can see the rise in the epidemic peak and the subsequent later deaths. There were uh, 539 deaths uh, in all settings uh, following uh, in the last period, uh, but the seven-day uh, rolling average now is uh, is a midweek one, uh, which is the most robust figure. We can see the variation over the weekend periods in that slide, um, and this is the lowest I think that has been we've seen since the end of March. Uh, again, really importantly, that all the social distancing measures, all the things that we've been doing, we need to keep doing uh, to maintain that gradual decline in the line. Next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, just a, a quick comparison. Uh, it's important that we compare data internationally, uh, and this is global death comparison, uh, but as we've mentioned frequently, there are variations in how different countries uh, measure those deaths, and these are numbers rather than rates. Thank you. Jenny, thank you very much. I think we've got a string of questions, and first of all, um, Thomas from London. It's safe to lift any lockdown measures, considering that our track and trace system is not yet operational and that our comparatively slow decline in daily deaths means that we have little margin for error. How safe is it to lift any lockdown? Well, um, Thomas, thank you very much for that question. I think you've nailed it. We, um, we've got the latest data from SAGE. Uh, we have come through the peak, but it is a very delicate, and as I said before, uh, a very dangerous moment, so we do need to proceed with caution. Um, the Prime Minister is going to set out uh, a roadmap, and that will not just include the kinds of things that we're looking at doing, but the criteria to make sure that we make uh, sure-footed steps uh, and we can monitor very carefully any changes incrementally we make uh, to make sure that we don't see the virus get back uh, its grip uh, on this country and see the R rate, as it's been explained uh, here this afternoon, go back up. So, yes, there's an opportunity to move to the second phase and start looking towards that, uh, but it has to be done very carefully, subject to strict conditions, uh, with strict monitoring to make sure that we do it in a controlled and sustainable way. Thank you for your question. I think we've got one from Brandon from Warrington now. Brandon asks, how does the government intend to control ongoing outbreaks in prisons, particularly in terms of balancing the rights of prisoners against the health and safety of prison staff and their families, which is being put at significant risk? I have to say, I think the uh, prison system uh, and all of those prison officers have done an incredible job. Uh, we've, of course, there's concern around uh, COVID-19 in prisons, both for uh, staff but also for uh, offenders. We've got a, a plan in place which has meant that that hasn't become uh, a, a, a major issue, but we take nothing for granted. We're not complacent about it for a moment. Um, I spoke to the Justice Secretary this week. Uh, we're monitoring it very carefully, but actually uh, we're confident that we have the situation uh, under control. I think we're going to move over to the media now. Laura Kunzberg from the BBC. You're on mute, Laura. I don't know whether that's at your end or... That should be okay now. Can you hear me? Well done. Don't worry, that's not your quota of questions gone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, can you just confirm on point of fact, are you renewing the restrictions today as you have to do under the legislation? And 
Nicholas Sturgeon has said it's potentially catastrophic to move away from the stay at home message. Given that the disease is still prevalent in many parts of the country, are you really sure that it is safe to lift any of the restrictions, however gradual rolling down the lockdown, rolling back the lockdown might be? And if I could ask um, Dr. Harris, um, you said that the R is somewhere between 0.5 and 0.9. Can you tell people exactly what the R level is in different parts of the country, given that it's such a key factor in how the decisions will be made? Thanks, Laura. Well, first of all, uh, I think whether you're in London, Edinburgh, Cardiff or Belfast, uh, as we enter another long bank holiday weekend, I think the message is very clear. Uh, follow the guidance. To answer your question, there is no change today in the guidance or in the rules. Uh, but as I've also explained, the Prime Minister will set out a roadmap on Sunday. Uh, and of course, we are uh, locked into the closest cooperation collaboration with the devolved administrations uh, through COBRA. But also the Prime Minister spoke to um, the First Ministers uh, today. He reiterated our commitment to continuing a UK-wide approach uh, to tackling the pandemic. Uh, even if different parts may move at slightly different speeds. But I think the key thing is that uh, those decisions are made based on the science and the circumstances for each nation. Ian, do you want to comment on the other point that was raised? Well, the question that was asked is, um, what is the R around um, the UK? And clearly there is some variation and uh, we are absolutely working uh, with some fantastic estimates that are done by our modelling community. Uh, and I think the, the, the consensus is that it is below one everywhere, lowest probably in London, but certainly uh, some variation across the different regions. Oh, would you like a, a, a follow-up question? Um, yeah, can I just, on, the, on that point, is it, is it possible to give us those exact numbers, but also just to you, Foreign Secretary, you stood there at that same lectern time after time and said that it would be wrong to talk about lifting any kind of restrictions because you might give people the wrong impression. Yet yeah, isn't that what, exactly what the government risks doing now ahead of what looks like being a very sunny bank holiday weekend when many people are just desperate to get out? Well, first of all, I've said very clearly, and I'm very happy to say it again, that there's no change in the rules today. Uh, what the Prime Minister will do is set out on Sunday a roadmap that can look to the future and explain what steps will be taken at what moment in time and critically the evidence that will back it up. We've always said consistently from the outset we've got to take the right decisions at the right moment in time guided by the evidence. That is consistently what we've said from the outset and that approach is uh, continuing. Is there anything else you can say on the article? No, I think, um, I mean, I'm quite happy to um, produce them later but we don't have them right in front of me now. Laura, thanks very much. Libby uh, Weiner from the ITV. Yes, hello, Foreign Secretary. Thanks Hiya. very much. Um, this afternoon, one of your advisers, Professor John Edmonds, told MPs that transmission in the community was no longer a problem. He suggested that the epidemic was now centred on hospitals and care homes. Do you accept that the government blundered in not focusing on these particularly vulnerable areas earlier? And that's why the lockdown is having to go on for so long for the rest of us. Well, first of all, it's good news that the R level uh, has come down uh, overall. Uh, that's because of the measures we put in place, because uh, when I stood here before the Easter back holiday, we said you've got, we've got to stick to our guns here. And frankly, because of the efforts of the public in following that guidance and indeed the brilliant essential workers in the NHS care homes and otherwise, we have get, definitely got a challenge in care homes. Uh, the CQC data uh, that came out um, I think yesterday showed that overall in care homes uh, the number of deaths was down by over 300 uh, on the last week, um, so that's positive, but there is still a very significant issue in care homes. Uh, Jenny and I were in a Cross Whitehall meeting yesterday looking at exactly how we ramp up every bit of what we need to do around the social distancing in care homes, the ebb and flow of people into care homes, the PPE, the testing, to make sure we bear down on this problem. Uh, and you're right as, as well, there's also an issue in hospitals. So uh, it's good news that overall uh, that we've got control uh, across the country. But of course, as we've always said, we've got to make sure that we see consistent falls in the death rate and the infection rate uh, across all settings. And that's how we will continue uh, with our approach. Could I also just say, and Professor Edmonds would also have said, and I would certainly say, that in early March, uh, as we started to move towards 
uh, the policies that the public have been so wonderful in taking place, we were doubling the size of the epidemic in every three days. Uh, and I think if you look at the graph that um, Dr. Harry showed earlier, you see a very steep upward curve. The fact that it is coming down now is because, I believe, of the success that ONS has been measuring, as many other people, of the lockdown measures. Libby, would you like to follow up on any of that? Yes. Uh, can I ask, um, uh, on another topic, uh, essentially there is a uh, huge uh, amount of data now suggesting that uh, black adults in this country are particularly vulnerable. Perhaps the death rate is something like four times that uh, for the equivalent uh, people um, of uh, white ethnicity. The government said it's looking into it. Are you actually going to do something about it to protect, for example, frontline workers from these ethnic groups? Well, uh, look, first of all, we're very concerned about it. It's something we take very seriously. We're learning more about this virus uh, all the time because it's uh, new. Um, and we've asked Public Health England to look very carefully at all of the implications and, and how it is affecting different communities, but particularly uh, the BME community. And once we've got the advice back from them, we'll know what uh, interventions uh, can sensibly be made. And that's the way, we, again, as, as we've said throughout, we need the scientific evidence to back up any policy decisions that we would want to make in that front. Thank you, Libby. Beth Rigby from Sky News. Thank you. Um, First Secretary of State, the Prime Minister said in the Commons yesterday that there will be changes to the lockdown from Monday. And millions of people would have read that that will include more outdoor exercise and sunbathing. And yet today, you're saying that they must adhere to the lockdown ahead of a statement on Sunday as we go into this sunny bank holiday weekend. Can you see how the public will find this really confusing? Do we sunbathe on Monday, but not on Sunday? And just to follow up on Libby's question, should BAME people now be shielding as they are potentially more vulnerable and at greater risk of catching and dying from coronavirus? Well, in, in relation to the BME question, we'll take decisions as policy makers when we've got clear advice uh, from PHE uh, on the causes and the implications and what we could responsibly do. I think that's the responsible thing for ministers to do. Um, in relation to uh, any next changes or any ne second phase, look, we're going to be guided by the evidence. Uh, we've had updated uh, evidence from SAGE, uh, there's further evidence that is coming through, and we obviously have to take those decisions at the right moment in time based on that evidence. Uh, and uh, I, you know, whatever has been reported in the newspapers is not a reliable guide to either the evidence that we're getting or the policy decisions that we'll be taking. And so that's why it's very important that Prime Minister on Sunday will set out a roadmap. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that any changes uh, in the short term will be uh, modest, small, incremental, and very carefully monitored. And as of now, there is no changes. But the key thing is that we want to give a response, in a responsible and a sure-footed way, a sense of the roadmap ahead, coupled with the milestones and the conditions, so that people have the reassurance and the confidence, yes, that we'll protect life and preserve our way of life, uh, but that we're doing it in a responsible way. And of course, if we find, and this is very important at this stage in the virus, not just for the UK, but for others at a similar stage, having come through the peak, uh, w if we find in the future that the, the R level goes back up or that we find that people aren't following the rules, we must have the ability then to put back measures in place. And that is the way we can responsibly go through uh, this stage and, and transition into a second phase. But as, as we've always said, Beth, we're going to take the right decisions at the right time. And so for the moment, it is really important, particularly as people look towards a warm bank holiday uh, weekend, that we continue to follow the guidance in place at this time. Beth, did you want to come, up, uh, come back with a... Yeah, yeah. Just just then, given, given that we're going into the bank holiday and you are formally rolling over the lockdown, isn't it unhelpful if the Prime Minister says on Wednesday that he doesn't, he wants to roll, that there might be changes on Monday, and then he doesn't turn up today to tell the British public uh, what those changes might be ahead of the bank holiday? Well, that's, sorry, Beth, that's simply just not the case, and I've set out what we're doing. We're explaining that the Prime Minister on Sunday, when we've compiled all the evidence and we can do so in a responsible, sure-footed fashion, will set out the roadmap ahead. 
Uh, any measures that will be taken um, uh, next week will be uh, relatively modest, incremental steps, carefully monitored, subject to all of the qualifications that we've already set. But we will set out a roadmap with milestones, maximum conditionality on that, so that we can make sure we take sure-footed steps. So I know you, people are desperate to know what he's going to say on Sunday, um, uh, but I'm not going to jump the gun. We've always said we'll take the right decisions at the right moment. Thank you very much, Beth. Chris Smythe from The Times. Thank you. I'll try out a couple of things. Firstly, temperature testing uh, is not something we've done before because obviously it missed cases. It's not a panacea. Uh, but in places like South Korea, it's a regular part of being allowed into airports, workplaces, restaurants. And it's been reported that uh, we're looking at here, here. So is that the next lesson that we're going to learn from Asia? Um, and then following up from Libby's question, I mean, Professor Edmonds also said this afternoon there are about 20,000 new infections of coronavirus every day at the moment. And can I ask Siri, and he's obviously studying this, if he agrees, and if not, what his estimate is. Um, and First Secretary, you uh, put quite a wide estimate on R, uh, and Professor Edmonds also said it was very much at the higher end of that, just below one, and indeed higher than it was two weeks ago, largely because of what was happening in hospitals and care homes. So is that a concern, and how much is that delaying, how much we can loosen restrictions? Uh, Chris, you managed to squeeze in three questions there, very, uh, very uh, craftily done. Um, so in relation to the R, I mean, I, I, all I've done is articulate uh, the R level and the range that was uh, explained to us. In relation to any potential um, restrictions uh, at the border coming into this country, well, those will be announced in due course and sensible way. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I think the evidence so far has always been that um, temperature tests are not a particularly effective way uh, of proceeding. But I think the critical thing, and um, we've taken advice on border measures, and I've asked consistently this question to uh, CMOs, deputy CMOs, chief scientific advisors, and all the other scientists. Um, and I think the evidence suggests that you would, once you've got the, there's not much point in, in, in taking those measures until the R level is down below a certain point. But as you start to get control of it, what you don't want is the virus reseeding in the UK, uh, the source of that being from abroad. And that is the point at which you would want to consider um, restrictions or monitoring at the, at the border. I don't know whether... Shall I just Please add do. a comment to that? Because I think also you were referring to potential use in other environments, so restaurants and things like that, which I think is a routine part of South Korean uh, working. I, I mean, I, I think there is a strong reassurance mechanism for the public, but as I've said previously, if you have a disease uh, and it has an incubation period of, say, up to 14 days, the likelihood of finding somebody at the points where they have a temperature uh, and you have a reliable bit of kit, so most thermal scanners will uh, be distracted, if you like, from uh, environmental colour, uh, density and temperatures as well. So there's, you need a reliable bit of kit, but even then your chance of picking somebody up is very small. But, um, but it, it can have a reassurance uh, mechanism, I think. And I, the other really important thing in relation to COVID-19 is a sizable proportion, up to about a third of people, do not have a temperature at presentation. They may have it variably through the illness or they don't have it. They come with, we're learning more as we go through about the symptoms uh, and signs that people have. So I don't think we could expect that. We want to catch people, if you like, in the early phase of the disease where they're most likely to transmit and not all of them will have a temperature. Serene. You, you asked the question about whether I agreed with um, Professor Edmonds, and I think we're incredibly lucky in this country to have mathematicians of the quality of Professor Edmonds uh, and the others in the various teams uh, around um, the UK who are making those estimates, um, and they are based on new data every time. They make two estimates uh, a week, uh, and I think uh, I would personally um, support them. Over the next few weeks, they will be getting extra data through a very large study that the ONS is doing together with the University of Oxford, the University of Manchester and Wellcome Trust, uh, which will provide, if you like, direct community evidence, both on the number infected at a particular time, number of people infected at a particular time, and also the number of people who have had at some stage um, the, the virus and therefore uh, have an antibody uh, to it. And those data, as they become available on a weekly basis over the next uh, while, will inform those numbers even more. But to answer your question straight, I'm very happy with those numbers. Chris, did you have a follow-up? Maybe just limit yourself to the one. 
Yeah, so on R then, I mean, the fact that it is higher than it was two weeks ago, is that delaying what we can do? And does it mean we have to wait for the outbreak in care homes to be under control? Um, well, I, I, I probably should defer. I'm not, I'm not sure. With, I mean, the range... I mean, uh, sorry, go sorry, on. Yeah, you, no, no, you, you far away. I mean, R, Professor Evans, I think, is right that R has probably gone up just a little bit from his last estimates, and that is driven by the epidemic in care homes, he would say. Uh, and I would not demur from that. That gives us a real challenge to reduce uh, the epidemic in care homes, uh, and it's one that I think over the next few weeks, uh, from what I see happening, uh, I think will happen. I think it's important to recognise that the R number itself is only relevant if you look also at the context of the prevalence. Uh, and I think we need to bring the two together properly uh, to understand where we are. Let me just give you an example, and for Secretary, if you wouldn't mind me being technical for a minute. Yeah, please do. If you imagine a situation where we have the prevalence at 0 0.40s or even 0 0.50s, one, so in other words, tiny, tiny numbers, and that is the same every week, then the R would be one, because it's flatlining. And that is so important that we always think about R in the context of the prevalence. Uh, and that's why I think at the moment you know, we need certainly to get on top of the um, epidemic in the care homes and in hospitals. I know and Dr. Harries would be able to comment there's an awful lot of work going on in, in those arenas. Uh, but I do think also that in the community we have things relatively low at the moment. So overall, the R level is down, but there's obviously clearly a challenge that remains in care homes, although, again, I just point to the CQC data, which shows that the uh, number of deaths uh, is down over 300 on this time last week. But the reality is uh, our top focus is on the hospital infections and on the care home settings. We've got a very robust and rigorous plan to really drive down uh, the infection rate in those two settings over the next month. Uh, and we're confident we can deliver on that. Jenny, I don't know if there's anything you'd add on. Um, well, just to reinforce what you're saying, I think, so um, there are a number of things that you can do to try and uh, support care homes and support residents in them, and I think we need to focus equally, not just on the residents, but on the staff as well, um, because these are quite closed communities, if you like, um, and uh, as we've been talking about the R in the community where everybody has done so well to bring that number down, but of course uh, workers who are working in care and health settings also are part of their local communities, so we need to make sure uh, that we uh, address uh, infection prevention and control measures and really make them robust. Um, we uh, test uh, now, we have always been testing uh, for outbreaks, but I think we're getting new information coming through about asymptomatic infection and how that particularly presents in the elderly. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, those are the uh, people who are probably most at risk. So using that new evidence, uh, uh, increased testing and uh, increased focus, and also new support coming in from NHS England in, in terms of giving clinical support to our care homes, that uh, I think that focus will be uh, We've seen, well, we've seen some positive signs already. I'm sure that will continue. The single biggest challenge we've got in care homes is the ebb and flow of people in and out of them, particularly when they're, uh, uh, they're not showing signs uh, of having the virus. Uh, so at least that's something we can control and really focus on with uh, laser-like precision, and that's what we'll do. Chris, thanks very much. Mesa Hall from The Express. Uh, thank you, Foreign Secretary. Um, to uh, Dr. Harris, um, what's the latest medical thinking about the impact of warm weather on uh, the virus? Is there any uh, danger that any uh, lockdown restrictions that are eased over the summer months may have to be reimposed over, over in the winter, in the autumn, uh, because of seasonal variations? And um, Foreign Secretary, a question about the government's um, contract contact tracing app. Um, people who download this app um, face being asked to go into isolation possibly multiple times if they come into contact with people who've reported symptoms. Will they be entitled to sick pay or will their employers be entitled to any compensation if they're forced to go into isolation again and again? Well, just on that, I think jumping again a little bit on the guidance, but the key thing is, I think it will be uh, 
a liberating thing for people because, and indeed for the country as a whole, because it will allow people uh, who might have the symptoms to be clear that they don't have coronavirus and therefore not be subject to all of those restrictions. And that's the most important thing. Um, but it will actually allow people to get out of the isolation measures earlier than otherwise would be the case. Jenny, um, yeah, so picking up the, uh, the issue about weather, um, I think obviously it was a, it's a new virus and we are still learning about it, and so I would like to leave the evidence base open a little bit. Uh, but when uh, we first learned about it, of course, if we look at something like seasonal flu, there was a possibility that it might behave in the same way, and in that way we might imagine that in the warmer weather now we would see a decline. But if you look around the world, we're seeing epidemics in warm and cooler climates. So I think... Uh, probably not a lot of evidence there. But your point about uh, lockdown and the winter is a really important one. I don't think it particularly relates to lockdown, but it does relate very much to uh, active work now. Uh, first in pushing, as we push, and we're more successful in pushing that peak forward, which we've seen, uh, we definitely don't want a second peak, uh, and we don't want it in the winter because people uh, will be suffering from other winter infections, so they will be uh, increasingly debilitated. So all the work that's ongoing now, we must do safely, as the First Secretary has said, uh, but equally, it's probably a good place for me as a public health doctor to advertise all go and get your flu jab this year. Really, really important that people maintain their health and take every preventative measure that they can. Thanks, Jenny. Mesa, did you have any follow-up, sir? No, that's, that's fine, thank you. Brilliant. Good to speak to you. Gemma Crew from PA, final question. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Um, so we've heard about 20,000 people a day are still being affected. On Saturday, my colleague asked whether you know if uh, where people are contracting the virus. And I believe you said you have the data, but not to hand. Could we ask again, are people picking it up in, in supermarkets, public transport, or is it predominantly care homes and hospitals? As surely this is quite a vital part of the lockdown easing decision-making process. Well, I'll let um, uh, Ian and Jenny talk about the wider statistical picture, but as has already been explained, the evidence that's been provided to us is that overall we've got the uh, rate of infection down across the country, and particularly in the community. The two areas where there are specific concerns are care homes and hospital infections, and we have very clear concerted plan, covers everything from uh, cohorting and uh, the social distancing through to testing, uh, and PPE. So we, we, we're not complacent for a moment in those two settings, uh, but we do have a plan that we're delivering to, to bring it right down. Jenny, sure, so I add to that? Um, yes, I mean, to reinforce that, I think that's where our focus of attention is going forward and where we think uh, cases are potentially going to be at the higher end whilst the, those in the community are dropping off. It's very difficult to say precisely where an individual uh, caught their disease uh, because we're exposed to we have multiple exposures all the time and at a time of pandemic when a, an infection is fairly widespread um, it's difficult to pinpoint that we can look in some ways um, so for example looking uh, at different uh, transmissions in a chain of transmission and seeing where the most risks are and actually when we do that most of the transmissions are at home so the home environment is is a very strong environment for finding uh, linked cases uh, but equally there's some really uh, good genomics work ongoing at the moment which will give us really good data I think going forward to understand where the chains of transmission uh, are and, and actually where they came into the country from. I would just add one thing if I may all the data that we are looking at shows the success of social distancing uh, and if I may give a personal view uh, then uh, I do believe that social distancing and maintaining it over the next few weeks is going to be central to continuing to um, reducing the um, epidemic. Gemma, did you want a, a supplementary last question? Yeah, thank you. Can I just ask, um, you said uh, a moment ago about the problem being the ebb and flow of people into care homes. So doesn't that underline the need to properly get testing back up to 100,000 a day? And can I ask uh, if you're considering testing people, relatives that might be wanting to visit loved ones before they go into care homes? So I think the, the, the challenge, and, and it's actually similar in hospital settings as in care homes, is people who are not showing symptoms 
uh, but who have coronavirus passing on and the speed with which we can detect that. Testing is part of that, but also um, it's the movement of people in and out of those settings which is uh, fueling that transmission. So they're both parts of that problem. There's not a silver bullet here. Um, it's about putting all the different bits of the jigsaw to, together and having a strategic, uh, holistic approach. And we're confident now we've got enough information, we got the data, uh, and we've got the plan in place now to really drive down the, inf the infection rates in hospitals, but also in care homes. Gemma, thank you very much. And that brings an end to this uh, press conference. Thank you all very much.